Okay, welcome back to Think Tank. I'm Jay Fidel, your host, and this is Midnight in Brussels, featuring Gawi Kandekar, Deputy Director and Director of Europe of Global Relations Forum. We provide updates of events across Europe with Gawi. She joins me by, by Skype, Skype audio today from Belgium to address European topics of interest. And today, especially, we're going to talk about terrorism. Terror, terrorism continues in Europe. Hi, Gary. Happy New Year. How are you? Hi, Jay. Happy New Year uh, to you and all your um, listeners. And uh, everything is fine here. I hope uh, Honolulu is doing perfectly well. I hope so. Well, Honolulu is doing okay, regular, you know, as usual kind of thing. But Europe has uh, Europe has troubles that you know I'm happy to report we don't have. Uh, so can we talk about uh, the continuing terror in Europe? Most recently, the the market attack in Germany. Yes. Well, um, you know, Christmas markets are a big tradition in Europe and especially in Germany. They're quite special. Um, and um, after the various attacks that have taken place, especially in Nice. Uh, and you know, every day there are terror threats uh, that transpires. Um, so there was um, the danger that the Christmas markets would be attacked. Yes. Uh, also because they're a religious symbol. Yes. I mean, yes. it has to do with Christian tradition. So um, it was known that the Christmas ta- Christmas markets would be a target. Uh, and therefore, um, it unfortunately happened that um, uh, there was an attack in uh, in the Berlin Christmas market where Anis Amri, who is a Tunisian uh, immigrant, um, and who was, uh, so we'll also discuss his history, but he carried out a really bad uh, attack uh, at the market. It was something like what happened in Nice, where he drove a truck yes. through uh, crowds. Um, and there were 12 dead, but a lot uh, injured and injured gravely. So well, unfortunately, this is what happened during Christmas here. Yeah, that's a way to, that's a way to dampen Christmas for sure. But what, I think what troubles me about it is, that, is the repetition of the Nice uh, incident. In this case, uh, the, the guy uh, uh, commandeered the truck, killed the driver, took the truck over. Um, it's it's clever, you know, in the way of terrorism. You don't have to have anything, uh, just whatever he used to kill the driver. Uh, and all of a sudden now you have a weapon and you drive it into a crowd. Uh, I have a feeling that the success of these two attacks is going to be repeated. Yes, I mean, this is what ISIS had... Um Uh, basically called for uh, in Europe these kinds of attacks. They said if you have a car, just drive it through the crowds. Uh, Kill maximum number of people as possible. So this was um, basically the advice, let's say, or propaganda that was, uh, that ISIS has been using for um, terrorist attacks in Europe. Uh, European uh, security agencies have been working quite hard especially after the Brussels attack. So the formation of terrorist cells, well-developed terrorist cells, um, is quite circumscribed. So uh, these lone wolf attacks, as you see, which people are self-radicalized on the internet or via some mosque where they might meet these um, groomers, uh, and their means are limited. Therefore, whatever is available, like these mega trucks, large trucks, which could cause damage and which draw international attention because that's the main goal it's not about killing a handful but about spreading terror basically yeah uh, and they, they they succeed in that actually unfortunately they do succeed well you know I, it's very interesting uh, you know the connection i mean so all of europe is connected and europe includes the european parts i think of, of the middle east for example uh, turkey and israel and uh, there were two pieces that I picked up this morning on CNN. One, one is that uh, somebody noticed that an enormous number of Jews have left um, Paris because of, because of terrorism after the Charlie Hebdo incident. Until now, the number, the number of Jews emigrating away from France, apparently because of this, um, you know, has dramatically increased. And, of course, they, uh, they, a lot of them go to, uh, to Israel. And then at the same time, 
there's a story about, and I don't know the details, but there's a story about a truck incident in Jerusalem where four Israeli soldiers were killed uh, in the same vein, I believe, as uh, Nice and, uh, and the German market. So what we have is, um, you know, uh, connect the dots kind of spreading, whether it's lone wolves or uh, more actively inspired by ISIS. It sounds like it's all ISIS, directly or indirectly, and it's, the, you know, these kinds of modus operandi are repeating themselves, not only in yeah. Europe, Gary, but everywhere that's halfway European. Uh, True. True. Well, basically, um, just to start with the uh, Jewish community, um, if you see the past terror attacks have targeted indiscriminately. So they've not particularly sought out specific communities. Well, the Christmas market here, I mean, you know, a large uh, majority of, um, a large number of Europeans are, or call themselves atheists. So they don't um, conform to the, themselves to the Christian values or traditions or even the religion. So these Christmas markets are not really uh, Christian, let's say, but um, traditional. Yeah. Um, in that sense, okay, it may be religious, seen as uh, something to do with religion, but the Jewish community has not been targeted in these recent attacks in uh, Brussels, mm -hmm. also various um, uh, uh, locations that were sought in the uh, November 2015 Paris attacks um, or the Nice attacks. That said, um, Jewish organizations have been uh, targeted in the past in various places globally, I would say. Um, like we've spoken about the Jewish Museum here in Brussels, um, but also in the Mumbai terror attacks that happened in India in 2008, uh, where a Jewish, uh, uh, I think, education center was targeted. Mm -hmm. And so um, organizations, belonging to um, the Jewish community have been targeted. That said, I wouldn't think that, you know, a specific community should be afraid. This is, Europe has been their home for, you know, oh, forever, centuries, basically. Yes. Centuries, yes. yes. And, uh, and they have no reason to fear more than any other person. So I have um, this the same uh, amount of fear, I would say, like any other person here, mm -hmm. <laughs> probably more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, it's not targeted uh, for now. Appreciate that. Uh, what, what about Turkey now? Turkey had a pretty bad one uh, in that yes. nightclub on the Bosporus a, a week ago. Um, and that was, that was really too bad. Um, that would, I, I agree in that case it was there anybody and everybody. Um, yes. I, don't, I don't think they were intending to target one group or another. Just an, an iconic gathering. Uh, and um, they certainly had a profound effect on Turkey. Uh, I'm very concerned that Turkey, you know, is becoming destabilized because of this. Is, is there a connection? What is the connection and what is the effect of this terror in Turkey? Well, the Turkish nightclub uh, attack was, um, the source is unclear because the perpetrator has not yet been caught as far as I know. Um, is something related to do more with the war in Syria and Turkish uh, participation or the deal that Turkey is making with Russia for a ceasefire. And I think that could be the main motivation because Turkey is largely Muslim. Um, of course, there are different um, sects of Islam that do uh, cohabit uh, peacefully in Turkey. But I think it was more politically motivated, as you know, also the Russian ambassador to Turkey was shot yeah. uh, a week before that, I presume. Yes. Uh, so it's it's more politically motivated than than the attacks that happen here in 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 Europe, I would say. Well, let's turn to uh, let's turn to the uh, well let's turn to the turning. Uh, Europe seems to be turning right. Um, for for example, I uh, read that Angela Merkel uh, Merkel uh, is now uh, uh, operating on an initiative to deport uh, migrants. And uh, there was a piece uh, recently, um, I, it was on 60 Minutes yesterday, um, t to the effect that uh, there are hate crimes uh, on the rise in, in, um, in Britain. Um, so we, ha I, and I'm sure there are other indicia you can tell me about, about how people and political structures and leaders are turning to the right because of the terror, because of the migrants. What do you hear? What do you see in Europe on that? 
That's interesting. Um, so in Europe now, the discussion amongst the thinkers, the analysts is that um, whatever shift, whatever is causing the shift to the far right or to the right, let's say, of the spectrum is because of the failure of neoliberalism. So you're, they're, uh, they are arguing that Europe has forgotten its social democratic roots uh, and that neoliberalism is now uh, the main reason that's um, causing people to um, be at malaise. Uh, and to revolt against the system, let's say, in inverted commas. Yeah. Um, so that's the main reason. Now, the shift to the far, far right across Europe is different for different countries. In the UK, you see a backlash against Europe and European uh, immigrants. So there's a large community from South Asia, India, Pakistan and uh, and you've also had crimes related to, let's say, Pakistani and Bangladeshi migrants. Mm -hmm. But the communities that have been targeted in these racist attacks have been largely uh, the Eastern European um, migrant community. So Polish, uh, Romanian, Bulgarian. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's more to do with political motivations and which basically culminated in Brexit or the impending British exit from the European Union. Yes. Um, in Germany, what was interesting is that um, most people still consider Angela Merkel to be uh, the possible next leader. So it is, uh, even though Germany has faced the largest number of um, uh, migrant flows in Europe, uh, they've received the lar one of the largest numbers um, of Syrians uh, and Iraqis and other nationalities as well. Um, and these terror attacks Quite a few have happened in Germany, yet um, most people remain pragmatic. They're not um, um, falling prey to fear mongering mm -hmm. uh, and targeting um, Islam per se. Um, but if you s the trend that we see across Europe is that far right parties pick up agendas which seem too um, sensitive. To be discussed for example islam so when they uh, criminalize islam they are um, offering a platform to individuals that may have not um, wished to speak about that in political mainstream uh, politicians that avoid speaking about these issues that are seen as more taboo uh, and 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 take the line of multiculturalism so these far right parties have taken advantage of that fact even though at their inception, um, Islam has not been one of the main causes uh, of their formation. So especially in Germany, where you see the Pegida movement, they had nothing to do with Islam. Uh, the neo-Nazis as well had nothing to do with Islam. It's more about the economic malaise, um, but also as many analysts now agree, the failure of neoliberalism. Yeah, we're, not in a, we're not in a good time. And and I would add that the U.S. is not in a good time either. Let's take a short break, Gary. That's Gary Kondakar with the Global Relations Forum. Uh, we'll take one minute. We'll be right back. And we'll discuss some more about how these things are affecting Europe and how Europe is changing. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlove and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. Okay, we're back. We're live with Gowri Kandakar. 
uh, and we're talking about uh, the terrorism continues in Europe, but there are other things to talk about too here on uh, Midnight in Brussels, and she stays up late to talk to us. So, Gary, uh, you know, what, what is the perception and reaction around Europe to uh, uh, all that we see in the press in the, in the U.S. Uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I'm blocking. <laughs> from Donald J. Trump. Um, it, <laughs> it's like every day, all the media always talking about him. I mean, they, he, he commands and dominates the media. And I wonder if he commands and dominates the media in Europe the same way. Yes, everybody is mainly shocked. Um, it's, uh, it's surprising how the Twitterati in Brussels tweet so much about the U.S. elections, U.S. issues, uh, about uh, uh, Obamacare, but also um, abortion. And there were, I think uh, yesterday there was a march by women in uh, I forget the term. Well, the anti-abortion rallies, basically. Yeah, in Europe. Uh, in Europe. Yes, in Europe against uh, anti-abortion in the U.S. <laughs> so um, overall, uh, Europe is quite scared. About what Trump might do. Yeah. Yes, about the election of President Trump, um, and this is mainly because he has uh, denounced NATO which is the security alliance underlining peace in Europe. Uh, and he's spoken quite fondly about Russia, even uh, denouncing uh, the US, uh, current US President Obama's uh, claims, you know, that Russia has been behind hacking. So um, Europe is quite afraid because Russia is quite belligerent, uh, especially on the eastern borders, as we've seen with the annexation of Crimea. So Russia is quite active uh, militarily and uh, strategically as well. Russia is playing a military role now in Syria, which was seen as the US um, geostrategic uh, sphere of influence and also European. But now Russia has overtaken the Middle East, let's say. Uh, and so Europeans are afraid. So Russia is one reason, NATO is another. And the third one, surprise or not surprisingly, is climate change because um, President Obama has, uh, sorry, um, President-elect Trump has said that he doesn't believe in climate change, it's a Chinese hoax, and that he's going to roll back U.S. efforts against um, climate change, which has left many in Europe worried because climate change is quite a huge priority here. Yeah, it strikes me that in the, you know uh, that right now uh, Europe is, seems to be more liberal, more conscious, more aware, more in tune with um, you know global events and issues than the U.S. is, and then certainly than, than Donald Trump is, and uh, okay. you know, find I find that very interesting. That Europe becomes the moral leader, uh, or at least most of Western Europe anyway becomes the moral leader on world issues. Don't you feel that? Yes, it was funny when um, it was announced that uh, no, uh, Donald Trump won the U.S. elections. There were a few tweets which said that, oh, now Angela Merkel is the leader of the free world, basically, <laughs> <laughs> which is somehow true, you know. So overnight, um, the perception of Angela Merkel changed. So before that, as we've spoken in previous shows, she was criticized quite a bit about her immigration policy, open immigration. And suddenly, uh, overnight after the election of Trump, she was seen as a glimmer of hope in Europe, someone who could um, hold together the Western liberal world order, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, but yeah, most uh, what you just said surprised me that Europe seems more in tune with world politics. But, you know, this... U.S. is the superpower, so it's so funny for me, actually. Well, the U.S. is redefining itself, or let me put it this way, Donald Trump is redefining the U.S., and we're not sure what's going to happen, I, you know. Uh, uh, but, but one thing seems clear that, you know, he is emerging as a power, even as a, as a powerful leader, even in the president-elect phase and before, you know, the inauguration. He's making all these statements, and these statements are basically consistent with the kinds of things that he was saying during the campaign 
and that they are very threatening to a lot of people in the U.S. and apparently yes. a, a lot of people in Europe too. So it's not, you know, it's not going to resolve so quickly. As a matter of fact, it could get worse. You know what? What one yes. uh, one uh, one commentator says uh, is it's going to get worse before it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, as, as disappointing as that might sound, I mean, that's the analysis. I mean, everybody's gone into 2017 a bit depressed, a bit uh, lost of, uh, a bereft of hope, I would say, um, because politics has changed. U.S. politics is completely changing. Um, and nobody knows how the international system is going to function because it was the U.S. underpinning the global order. Yeah. Uh, and who's going to take leadership? Who's going to provide peace around the world? Yes. Um, well, and, it's not going to be Vladimir Putin. Um, Vladimir Putin, <laughs> you know, it's clear that he's made Russia more powerful. He's dominated, as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the Middle East now through his activities in and around uh, Syria. U.S. is U.S. announced this morning that it, it had a, a raid in, in Syria against ISIS. But, you know, um, I think U.S. comes out number two on that. And they're also in the air, and they're competing with uh, the Russians for airspace over Syria. But it, I think the U.S. comes out number two in that. And really, the, the, you know, the question is, how, how do people see the emergence of Putin? How do they see Putin as, uh, you know, the, the one who is uh, essentially attacking, um, you know, Ukraine and also the Baltic countries, and who is doing hacking on a regular basis for all of the countries that he's, that he's trying to get advantage on? Um, are people concerned about him? Well, there's always been fear and mistrust vis-a-vis uh, -vis Putin in Europe. Uh, always. There's never been a moment, I would say, especially in Eastern Europe, po Poland, the Baltic countries, uh, the Nordic countries, where they've not um, relaxed, you know. They've, they've always been on edge. And that's why the majority of NATO focus lies on Europe's eastern border. Um, the missile defense systems are all mainly in Eastern Europe. Um, but I have a theory, Jay, if I may. Oh, please. And this is the topic of one of my papers is that you see a more, um, uh, ri um, uh, more active Russia, a rising Russia, but that's not um, because of Europe. That's not because Russia has ambitions to take over Europe. But it's more to do with China, because China is emerging as a regional superpower and a global leader, uh, and it's Russia's closest neighbor. So if you've seen uh, China in a Asia, it's, a, it's the dominant, um, it's the alpha male, let's say. Uh, China is more and more active in Central Asia, in Africa, of course, and Russia has seen... Um, China as uh, interfering with its traditional uh, sphere of uh, influence. And this is my theory that it's more geared towards China than towards Europe. Where can we see your paper, Gary? <laughs> it's kind of, I'm still working on it, but it will be up soon. And I'll definitely send you a copy. Okay, please. Well, you know, the thing, the thing about China, you know, uh, reminds me of something really remarkable that happened this week where the Chinese announced uh, they were establishing a, uh, a rail line, a direct rail line, mostly uh, freight rail line, but probably yeah. passengers as well, from Beijing into, into Europe, into Western Europe. Uh, this is, this yeah. is a romantic notion. Have you heard about it? What does it mean? Of course. Well, the thing is, uh, uh, China is trying to recreate the Silk Route which connected um, Asia and Europe, basically, Eastern China to Western Europe. Uh, and it's called the uh, um, One Belt, One Road Initiative, Obor, mm -hmm. uh, which includes sea links and road links. And it's going to be a vast, vast network of infrastructure um, and connections, transport and infrastructure, telecommunications as well. Uh, and this network passes to Central Asia, but also... Um, the Caucasus uh, uh, and other Eastern European countries, which, as I mentioned, have been Russia's traditional sphere of influence. Um, See, so China has been very active. China has money at the moment and it's investing. It needs to invest. Uh, Europe is seen as a huge market for China. It's its top 
trading partner. Yeah, um, and, and with that trade, it'll be able to deliver enormous quantities on a steady, continuous basis of, exactly. of trying to manufacture goods into the heart of Europe. And exactly. And this is one of the fears that's rising also vis-a-vis -vis Trump, is that the more uh, aggressive he gets against China, and if he ha if this erupts into U.S.-China trade war, there's going to be more dumping of Chinese goods in Europe. Well, because I wanted to Europe ask you about the, the economy of Europe in general these days. I mean, there are various yes. factors playing. Of course, there's a terrorism factor. There's the Russian yes. factor. There's the uh, yes. American election factor in the comments from Donald Trump. Um, yes. And, of course, uh, you know, you have the Brexit factor, all these things. Uh, and, of course, you have the, the Trump, uh, you know, the, the Trump uh, boost in the stock market, um, yes. in, in, at least in the U.S., and my question to you is, how is the economy of Europe doing with all of those factors working on it? Is it, is it having a, a rally like the Trump rally in the U.S.? Or, um, you know, is, is it going the other way? Well, um, it's more continuous, uh, um, I would say growth, but low growth scenario. Uh, it's, there's not much growth coming in. The austerity continues as well. So there's no, not, um, it's not a dynamic economy. It wasn't since 2008, and it continues to remain uh, a stagnant economy with low growth scenarios across the board. Um, I think the European Central Bank uh, recently, last month, uh, announced more uh, quantitative easing measures, um, which means that also austerity continues. Um, there's not um, much trade in terms of free trade agreements externally. So, of course, the EU-Canada free trade agreement did come about after <laughs> much hassle because one small region in Belgium opposed it, so the entire agreement was held. Um, the the agree free trade agreement with the U.S. is now suspended. Trump does not want it. And many free trade agreements across Asia have been um, also in limbo. Um, but the euro has been uh, falling vis-a-vis -vis different currencies. Uh, the British pound has fallen. And I think the biggest challenge to the EU economy, the Eurozone economy, and the UK is going to be Brexit. It's not going to be resolved now. Um, there are analysts who uh, guess that Brexit might, be res might take 10 years of negotiations. So it's not going to be an overnight process. 10 years of negotiations to get the right deals. Um, the U London has been a financial hub for Europe. There are many banks that have operated from London and which now want to completely approve and move to continental Europe because then they have access to the huge European free trade area, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is going to create havoc for the UK economy because London is the biggest cash cow that the UK has. Its economy is largely centered on this city. So there are a lot of economic challenges, like you mentioned, uh, quite quite a few. Um, oh. Immigration, not for now. Yeah. I think the repercussions might come by later um, because the impact on, and I think we've discussed this as well, is the impact on the social security systems, the social welfare systems, um, will be compounded in time. So for now, immigration is less and less visible uh on the accounts let's say then then it would be um in a couple of years time yeah why do i feel you you've got some more papers in the pipeline uh around these economic issues and immigration issues what else are you <laughs> writing tell me what you're writing i'm very curious because it sounds like you're all over and and you're doing some fantastic work gary oh that's so kind of you I just finished a paper on human security, uh, the definition of human security and uh, how urbanization in Asia can be identified as human security. I'm actually tonight I'm finishing uh, my book. I've been editing a book on uh, the Asia Europe meeting. It's a forum like the APEC, but uh, it includes Europe and Asia. So I'm <laughs> tonight is the final deadline for the book. So I'm finishing that. And then again, um, my second book on Japan's security strategic partnerships. 
for this month. <laughs> you don't you don't get any sleep anyway. But anyway, we're not going to hold you up. We're going to let you finish your your papers and your books, and we'll say farewell. We'll say Happy New Year to you again, Gary, and we'll check in with you in a, in a few weeks to find out what else is happening, what what more is happening. It's really really interesting to talk to you and get your perspective. Excellent. Thank you so much.